Glyn, welcome back. It's great to have you on History Hit. It's great to be back here at Colchester Castle. Welcome to the Games. <laughs> well, I mean, absolutely. We're at the entrance of your new exhibition, all about gladiators in Britain. Now, when someone mentions gladiators, we may well think straight away of Italy and the heart of the Roman Empire, or maybe even North Africa, because of films like, well, Russell Crowe and Gladiator. But even on this far-flung frontier of the Roman Empire, there is evidence of gladiator fights happening. Absolutely, yeah. Here we are, sort of fringe of empire that gets used a lot. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, gladiators and the spectacular, where we get the modern name uh, spectacle from, uh, were deeply ingrained in Roman culture. So it's not surprising, really. Where the Romans are, you'll find, I suppose, elements of spectacular and the idea of gladiators fighting in arenas, yeah. And what types of evidence do we have from the archaeological record for this evidence of gladiators in Roman Britain? Well, in some ways, there's a lot of avenues of evidence, uh, but it's all very, very sparse. So we could look to the venues themselves to do have amphitheatres in Britain, although not all gladiator battles had to take place in those venues. Um, we can look to the written record, of which there is nothing. We can look to the epigraphic record, so the inscriptions. Again, very, very few things out there. So then we have to look, to, I suppose, to um, the people themselves. Do they leave behind elements of you know, them as performers, so their arms and armour, um, as well as the people themselves? So do we find gladiators buried in Britain? And here we have a few, uh, and in some cases, new pieces of evidence turning up. So if you put it all together, um, you can take a lot as well of the artefacts from Britain, mosaics, wall paintings, etc. Gladiators sort of uh, are everywhere in art. But you need the context to be able to tell you, were they here? You know, were they battling in this arena? Were they real people? And there we have a bit of a problem. But we have enough, I think, to say, yeah, absolutely. There were gladiators in, in Roman Britain. So it seems like there's this mix of direct evidence, which the object can almost reveal that, yes, there were 100% gladiators in Britain. And then all of this indirect evidence, like the mosaics, that, in, that hints at that there was this idea of gladiators, that they were commonly being portrayed, for instance, as you say, on art. Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, a good example is we have um, a fragment of a wall painting uh, from Colchester that it's a, very, it's a stock image almost of the gladiator in defeat. And so one gladiator fighting another, he, he raises his finger in submission. And I think this is still the only fragment of wall plaster from Britain that depicts an arena scene like that. Um, so, you know, that piece of evidence comes from a, probably a wealthy house in Colchester. But that doesn't, that's indirect evidence. It doesn't mean gladiators were here. It just simply means the owner, I suppose, of that house, um, I suppose, wanted to say they were keyed into Roman culture. Um, and what's interesting about that, that fresco, that painting, um, is it's a stock image. You'll see, I think, recently at Pompeii, they revealed a very similar uh, wall fresco there. So these things, uh, yeah, they are certainly indir indirect pieces of evidence sometimes. And you mentioned, of course, so we are in Colchester, and Colchester, back in Roman times, was this almost a hub, a centre of Roman culture? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we say it here, you know, Colchester, it kicks off as one of the most important cities, if you like, in, in Britain, in Roman Britain. Um, and there's a reason for that. And actually, this plays into the idea of why gladiators may have been here. And that's because it would have been the home to the imperial cult. So if you like, this is the worship of, of the emperor themselves, uh, a symbol of Rome, and indeed on their deaths, um, they, are, they are deified. So it's, it's worshipping uh, the spirit, if you like, of the emperor in that sense as well. So it's incredibly important. It's an incredibly important religious centre, and the imperial cult were across all the provinces, uh, syncing up back with Rome, I suppose. Um, what's interesting in terms of looking to gladiators and evidence is that the imperial cult, one of their duties was to put on uh, munera. So that's what we call gladiator fights. Uh, that's an interesting word as well, because it sort of means um, obligation or gift. And I suppose that's what they are. They're being put on in honor of the emperor, if you like, for the emperor, as well as in his name, for the people. And it's to celebrate him, I suppose, and they had a duty, they were bound by that. So they were one of the main sponsors uh, of the games and they would have happened here. So we can imagine these munera, these blood sports, including the gladiatorial spectacles, happening in a place like Roman Colchester, some, well, I guess almost 2,000 years ago now. 
And it seems that you found some incredible artifacts from this area of Britain too, to kind of back that up. Perhaps most famously, most extraordinarily of all, this pot, the original pot that we have in front of us today. Glyn, what is this? So this lovely pot <laughs> is known as the Colchester Vase and it was excavated to the west of the city uh, where, where one of the cemetery areas was of Colchester um, 170 years ago, exactly. And it's been on display in the museum pretty much ever since. I think it had a trip to London once at the request of Mortimer Wheeler, famous archaeologist, but it's pretty much been on display here. And I sometimes call it the gladiator pot because what we have on here is a as a depiction of arena scenes, and we can, we can talk through them. Well, let's talk through them, let's focus in, because the detail, the first thing when you have a look at this pot is the staggering amount of detail. All of the outside of this pot is covered in various either animals or human figures. Absolutely, so we've got sort of got three scenes going on, and you can read it like that. It's, it's a really dynamic, piece of art if you want to look at it in that way and I talk about these scenes because you can see these dotted lines going around and these divisions um, if we look here at the front we've got um, two we could call them bestiarii so the the, the beast hunters or another name is uh, venators so again these these types of beast hunters and we have uh, Mario here and Secundus and they're baiting a bear we know that because we also have this um, rather enigmatic inscription running all the way around the rim, which names the individuals. And that's not um, completely unique to Roman art. We get a lot of mosaics sometimes of the names of the combatants and even the names of animals sometimes. Sadly, we don't know, know the name of the bear here. So we have Mario and Secundus, and they're tormenting this poor bear uh, very briefly. Then we move on to sort of the, the main event, and we have uh, Memnon, the secutor. Yes, so he's very yes. distinctive this huge helmet, encasing helmet on his head, his large shield, his sword, which he carries in his left hand. So this makes him a left-handed gladiator, giving him a bit of an advantage. And he is fighting, or he has just bested, Valentinus, who is a retiarius. He's got his trident and his net, and he's actually dropped his trident. You can just see it at the base of the pot oh, here. Yes, um, and he raises his, his, uh, his, his digit, his finger up, He's submitting, basically. So we, we have captured a moment in time here. And I suppose what we don't know is whether Memnon spares his life. In some ways, that was always going to be down to the sponsor of the games, also the editor, the person... Well, the editor is the sponsor of the games, uh, and also the person who owns these gladiators, so the, the Lanista, I suppose. Um, and there's always some deals that need to be done there, because if he takes the life of Valentinus, someone is owed some money, and that's the trainer, that's the Lannister. And then lastly, to finish off, maybe this is a bit of, bit of filler, actually. This is a really traditional scene you see on beakers like this, known as hunk cups. We've got a lovely scene, we've got hares or rabbits here being chased by dogs, and there's a, there's a stag as well. And I do wonder, that's a really generic scene, and I wonder, if this is a commissioned piece, which is what we think it is now, which we can talk about, um, this might just complete the pot, if you like. Well, before we go on to that, I'd like to examine, let's examine in detail each of these various scenes, these three scenes that you highlighted. If we start with this depiction of the beast hunt, of this bear and these two figures, this is sometimes quite a horrific part of the infamous Munera that is overlooked compared to the gladiator spectacles themselves, that before the gladiators fought, in the morning of one of these events, these people, they were the stars of the show. Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. I think we, we don't really know what a, an average day at the Games was like. We often look to the Colosseum and what's recorded about that. I think sometimes Marshall, the Roman poet, is quoted, who, who wrote a book called The Spectacles. But that is recording the, the opening, if you like, of the Colosseum. So it's extravagant. And what you see in, in the provinces of Britain are never going to really be compared to the Colosseum. But we think there's a sort of a standard day, and you mentioned it. So to kick off, in the morning, you'd have the beast hunts, the, the Venatio. Um, and in some ways, I think you're right. I mean, it's almost more horrific than, than the, the numbers of gladiators coming through, because animals could be slaughtered in their hundreds, and indeed, utterly thousands uh, in Rome. At the Colosseum at the inauguration, I think in total, I think 9,000 beasts were, were slain. Um, it's hard to think of that amount of bloodshed, really, isn't it? It's, 
it, horrific. It really is. I mean, if we focus, therefore, on what these venationes, these beast hunters, are, are wielding, I mean, what are these particular, I guess, weapons or tools that they're holding? Yeah, it's quite interesting, actually, and I've worked with a number of specialists on the vase, uh, one including Nina Crummy, who's uh, a well-known uh, sort of Roman artefact specialist, and she's reanalyzed this with a really keen eye, and she's picked out some really interesting details. The fact is, firstly, the two uh, bestiarii, if you want to call them that, the beast, beast fighters, they're not dressed in the same way. You can see this chap over here, Mario, he's not got a lot on, he's got his little loincloth, and he's sort of holding two sticks as well. So maybe he's not so much aiming to kill the bear, but I don't know, sort of anger it, etc. cetera. Um, and then we have, yep, yeah, Secundus as well. And he's a little better armored and he's got this manica, so this piece of covering going up his arm, which may have been made of leather. And he's got a whip as well. And he's got uh, some sort of shin guards as well. So they're not dressed in the same way. They're not armored in the same way. And Nina suggests something really interesting that you might think of this as a duo here at play, but maybe it's a trio. Maybe these two characters, these two people, work with the bear a lot, and we should be seeing the bear as a third sort of part of this act, because um, it's hard to work out whether this is a traditional venatio where the bear is being hunted to be killed, or whether it's, it's got a more of a flavor of, um, I don't know, a bit of performance here and, and theatrics. I suppose we won't know. Were bears in Britain at that time or would they have been transported across from the continent to somewhere like here? Well, interestingly, we know actually I spoke of Marshall. He records Caledonian bears performing, if you want to use that word, being slaughtered, might be more accurate, in the Colosseum and its opening. So we know bears from Scotland are being transported over. But actually, um, we can talk about this in a little bit when we sort of mention the inscription on the vase. If we look to Germany, I think, you know, around sort of Zanten and the Rhineland area, I think uh, the military presence there, they're really operating, acquiring both people and animals for, for the arenas across sort of the, the Western Empire. So it may be actually that bears were coming straight from uh, Germany, which it may be the case of Valentinus as well. The Colchester vase stands at 22 centimetres tall, begging the question, what was such an elaborate and unique looking vase used for? It's interesting you mentioned the size actually, because technically this is what we would call a beaker. And when you think of a beaker, I normally think of something quite small, something you drink from. And I, I often recall this a supersized beaker. And what's interesting is, you know, this can't really perform the same function as a small drinking cup. Um, filled with a liquid, say wine, watered down wine. This is incredibly heavy. Uh, if you're using that in a sort of convivial context, a bit of Roman dining, everyone with friends around showing this off, it's a huge thing to, to lift up and pass around. Plus there's almost absolutely no damage to this pot. There's a bit of damage that may have happened post excavation, but otherwise th this is almost pristine. So I can't see it being handed round. So what is this? We call it a beaker, but it's huge. Um, it's probably not handed round. I think most likely the Colchester vase is a commissioned piece. It's a memento of the games and it has a second life as a cremation vessel. So we did find human remains in here that have been, have been analysed. Okay, go on. You can't leave us on a cliffhanger <laughs> like that. Come on, tell us about these human remains. What did the analysis of them reveal? So as part of the Decoding the Dead project, which you've, you, were, you were here chatting about before some time ago, um, this is one of the cremations we analysed. So an osteologist, um, Emily Carroll, um, <clears throat> analysed the cremation and we discovered that the person in here uh, was uh, a male, so sexed as a male, biologically, osteologically, and they're probably over 40 years at, at their, their time of death. They had a bit of... Um, uh, I think they, they had a bit of pathology going on, so they'd had a, a hardish life. Apart from that, we can't say a lot more. Other than, we also had um, their petrous bone analysed. So we have two petrous bones, they're in the ear, and uh, we, we undertook um, strontium isotope analysis on that, and that was uh, Professor Montgomery and her team at Durham University. And that worked out that this chap was, was not local to Colchester. So they may have come from some extreme parts of Britain to the west or right to the north up into Scotland, or indeed they could have come from some other part of the empire. Unfortunately, um, 
cremations were in the early days of undertaking isotope analysis. And so what we really need to do is, is analyse something else like the lead. And hopefully that's in the pipeline and that will be able to help us pin down potentially where this person was born. But they certainly, we can, we can say for sure that they weren't born in anywhere near Colchester or what was, was Essex back in, in the Roman period. I'm guessing we're getting into the world of conjecture to kind of theorise then if that figure who was ultimately buried in here could have been a fighter in one of these arenas. Yeah, so the cremation was well preserved. And I think unlike nowadays where we go for a cremulator and it crushes us to dust essentially, back then you'd have token parts of the cremation taken from the pile and placed in the, in the vessel. And I think we had over 50% of the, the body represented. And you have whole chunks. That's how we're able to determine biological sex, how we're able to determine age, etc., from diagnostic bones. But a little bit of pathology, but nothing to indicate, you know, did this person live the life of a gladiator in the arena? We, <clears throat> we didn't see any evidence of that. It was too hard to, to ascertain. So could they have been a gladiator? Um, it's what we pose in the exhibition here to people. So maybe they could have been just some sort of uber fan, a fan of the games, or we could maybe extrapolate a little bit further, maybe even suggest maybe they were the editor of the game, so the, the sponsor of the games. Maybe that's a worthy thing to record on here. Um, not that gladiators couldn't get rich, but it's only a very few across time and space in the Roman period who, who earn a great deal of money. You know, most people, most gladiators, they are slaves and, and die as slaves, unfortunately. Well, let's move on, therefore, onto the gladiators that we have on this vase itself. I'm being very careful moving it. As you say, it's about 220 millimetres in height, so it's quite, quite small, but decorated, full of detail. This is scene two, as you were yep. saying, and this is of that next part of the arena sports, which was the gladiatorial fights themselves. Absolutely. So we're on to the, the munus now, the gladiator fight, and uh, the main event, which could have happened in the afternoon if you're looking at a, a traditional setup of the day. And yeah, here we have, we have Memnon. He's a secutor, and they're really distinctive because they have this encasing helmet, if you like, with just the two eye holes. Um, he has his very large shield. He's got padding on one arm. Might be padding, could be leather, could be, could be metal, I suppose, as well. There's sort of different variations on the armour and some coverings on his legs too. So he's, he's quite a well-defended gladiator. However, he is also completely weighed down. And I don't know if you can imagine being in a, a metal helmet like that, that encases your head. If you think you've got to move around that sandy floor of the arena for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, that's how long we think maybe a bout would have lasted. Fighting, you know, technically fighting for your life. You can imagine how hard it would be to breathe in that, how hot it's going to be. So even though he's well protected, he's weighed down. And I think that's going to be, that's going to be effort. That's hard work. If we focus first on the helmet itself, now that helmet gives me nightmares because <laughs> I can see the eye holes and also I believe I've worn a replica of that style of helmet up in York about a year or so ago. And it was the most uncomfortable helmet I've ever worn because it presses right up against yeah. your face. It's really difficult to walk around, to breathe, to even to talk in that helmet. So I guess that was one of the things, wasn't it? He's heavily armed, but actually the gear that he's got is not the most effective for fighting. Absolutely, and you make a really interesting point there, because that helmet wasn't made for you. There's no reason to say these, these helmets, these weapons, the armaments were made for them. So maybe it's a helmet that does, slightly doesn't fit either. That's gonna be horrific. And I've got to also ask about this one particular piece of decoration on his shield. I mean, that's a swastika. Absolutely, it is a swastika, which nowadays we very much associate as a, a symbol of hate. But it is, in fact, a really ancient symbol, um, extending way back beyond the Roman period and, and in Italy to other places. But to Romans, this was an apotropaic symbol. So if you like, it warded off evil uh, and it was protective. And therefore, no reason to be alarmed that it's on the shield of a gladiator. And in fact, you know, many items of gladiatorial equipment could be decorated in this style with protective symbols which had all sorts of different meaning so um it's not out of place here although it does i think look quite odd to our, our modern eyes it does absolutely well memnon he is looking towards the other gladiator in this scene he's got his shield out front he's got his small sword about almost looks like he's about to deal a blow is doesn't it yep who is the object of his attack who is this other figure that we've got valentinus i believe yep so this is valentinus our retiarius 
he, he's been bested. Um, and this is, a, as you say, the Memnon sword is raised and we, we wonder what will happen. So the, the artist of this pot, the potter, has captured this moment, maybe at the bequest of the person who's commissioned it. We'll never know what happened to Valentinus, the Retiaris. He's dropped his trident to the floor. Um, he has this really interesting armour up his arm. We have the manica again up to the gallerus, which is, it's almost like a, a shield for the, the shoulder. It's strapped on here, which he can hide behind. And I should say the Secutor and the Retiarius are really common pairing. And they're one of the, the favourite pairings, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the later Roman period. The, as we've, we've sort of discussed, the way um, Memnon is dressed, the Retiarius Valentinus is quite different. He's, um, he can be quite speedy, I suppose. He's not weighed down. He's only got a bit of armour on his shoulder. Um, so he's got speed on his side. But he has got quite a weird weapon. He's got this trident and he's also got a net. We may even see a remnant here. Oh, That's yes, what he might be holding. Right. Very difficult to depict. But there might be a remnant of the net that he tries to ensnare his opponent in. Um, so I think this is what the Romans liked about it. Um, that what were these weird combinations, these pairings of fighters going to produce? You mentioned, you know, how restrictive some of this, this, this helmet is, etc. when you sort of put on a replica. Um, and this stuff wasn't designed to kind of assist them and help them. Gladiator's armour, in a way, was designed to, to be theatrical. And again, this is, the slip of this pot is sort of a, a browny purplish colour. It's quite dark. But gladiators themselves would have, would have sparkled in the sun in an arena. You know, their helmets golden or, or silver, the shields colourful with all these strange protective symbols on them. Um, I think ostrich feathers coming out the side of the helmet, plumes of feathers. I mean, there's so much colour and, and glitz. I think there you go, there you see the spectacular. There you're seeing the performance. Uh, and none of that really aided the gladiator. It wasn't there to help them win the fight, I suppose. We have their names, but we also have some other writing next to their names. What is this writing? So we have um, the word sort of a sec here for Memnon, secutor, or sac, I suppose, right. is technically how it's spelt. Um, and then we have V. I, 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 so nine, we'd normally write that as I, X, but it's not uncommon for the Romans to sort of spell that out in full, so to speak. So this is suggesting that Memnon has won nine fights. That's the interpretation. As I say, I work with a lot of specialists uh, on this pot, got a, a team of specialists together, and Dr. John Pierce at King's College London, who, amongst many things, is an epigraphist, and he sort of reassessed the inscription here. So, and he sort of goes with essentially the traditional interpretation, but this is suggesting that Memnon has won nine fights, which sort of places him as a, as a veteranus, so a veteran of the arena. So, you know, someone who's got a few fights under their belt and kind of knows what they're doing. Now, unfortunately, Valentinus has no fights to his name. There's no record of that. So he might be a, a tyro, so an untested gladiator. And maybe that's why we see what we see here exactly, that he's been bested by, by Memnon. Now, obviously, this vase is associated with burial and cremation now, the yeah. gladiator vase. It does beg the question, do we therefore have any other evidence for a tomb of gladiators or a gladiator burial in this area of Britain? I think that's, yeah, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? And it's funny that <clears throat> this has a second life as a cremation vessel, because it didn't start off like that. It was, it was made as a memento, I suppose, of the games. Um, and then it's reused, so we assume there's some intimate connection. But yeah, getting at that idea of, you know, where are the, where are the gladiators themselves, these people? I suppose there's... There's, you may have heard of it, I'm sure, the really interesting cemetery um, near York, so Driftfield Terrace, so in the cemetery area just outside York. They believe they found, well, potentially a gladiator graveyard. Um, you know, I think that's a pretty good interpretation of the osteological remains they found there, the human remains, where, you know, you look at some of the facts, so um, the demography, there's a, there's a lot of men there, okay, not a lot of women or children at all. Um, those men are not elderly in some cases. When they looked at their bones, they could see they had a hard life, I think, but also there was some muscle to them. They were sort of robust. And you start piecing this together. There's another aspect which is quite confusing in some ways, which is a lot of decapitation burials where the, the head, if you like, and what we are left with is the skull, obviously, but the head has been removed and either placed back with the body or, or elsewhere. 
So, you know, there are some other theories, are these, these criminals, etc. But I think overall, that's a pretty good interpretation of potentially what that cemetery is. <clears throat> One piece of evidence, which is really interesting, and I know they're still working on, is a pelvis bone from one of the skeletons, which clearly has bite marks of a large carnivore, which I think they believe could be a bear. I mean, you know, I'd hope it's a bear. I'm obsessed with bears now, having looked at the Colchester vase so long, or potentially a big cat. And I think they're still working uh, on this, doing some really interesting analysis of the bone. And hopefully, not too long, we'll, we'll find out what animal that was. But that's interesting too, because again, it's another piece in the puzzle of going, you know, were there, uh, were there venat venatios going on, on here? You know, did we have some of the impressive animals that the Colosseum did? Um, you know, I always assumed that we, we didn't, that bears would be maybe the, the most ferocious thing you'd find in a, an arena. But potentially if it's a big cat, that really, again, much like the Colchester vase and its reassessment, that would really put a different spin on what we think was going on in the arenas of Britain. A fascinating insight into what would have been going on at the gladiatorial games in Britain. But I wanted to return to the gladiators themselves and a particular pose we see from so many of them. We can see it here, the raised finger of Valentinus. Yeah. This is also a really specific gesture, you know, this, which is is on a lot of Roman art in, in context of, of gladiators. Um, the raised index finger, which, meaning submission. Um, what's interesting is uh, Memnon's there, almost poised. He's in action pose, but he was also frozen in time on this piece of ceramic. So he's sort of, he's ready to go, but it's not his decision whether he makes that sort of final kill. And that's gonna be down to um, the sponsor of the games, the editor. And of course they have, they've backed it. They've put all the money up. Um, and they will have had to have spoken to the trainer, probably in advance, the Lanista, who owns the gladiator, because, of course, these gladiators are slaves, and they, therefore they are his property. So they need a prior agreement, if you like. Otherwise, um, you know, there could be a lot of money swapping hands. And indeed, if, if the Lanista has said, you know, that's fine, yeah, if you want him to go, I suppose the sponsor could make that decision, but then he's, he's reacting to the crowd as well. I mean, it's a really unique thing, and then we obviously, there's obviously other gestures involved. We have the, uh, the, the turned thumb is the classic one as well, thumbs up, thumbs down. So it's interesting how gestures come into play into to Roman, Roman life. Well, come on, myth bust that. That is something we always associate with gladiators because of famous movies and others that Thumbs up means live, thumbs down means die. Yep. Is that right? Well, I don't think anyone's been able to solve it, but one of the best uh, articles I've, I've read on it by an academic suggests the opposite, actually, uh, that, that thumbs up, rather than a thumbs up good, thumbs up is bad, so I suppose uh, death to the, the gladiator, uh, and then thumbs down, good. And even then, even then thumb sideways might be a thing too. So I, I don't think it's definitively been proven, but they do bring in a huge number of sources, all these different literary texts, and playing off other ideas where gestures and hand gestures are used in the ancient world is really interesting. It is really interesting, but once again highlights that point, isn't it, that the story of gladiators in the Roman Empire, although we so often associate them with the Roman Empire as being this ever-present part of it. It's still a really enigmatic part of the story because of the evidence that we have surviving. And yet, thanks to research by yourself and others on objects like this, we're learning more, for instance, of the presence of gladiators in Britain. And I've got to say, looking at the quality of the artwork all around this vase, Surely it's got to be one of the most impressive, extraordinary vases that we have surviving from Roman Britain. Glyn, it just goes to me to say thank you so much for inviting me here to see this exhibition and a pleasure to have you back on History Hit. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.